To keep yourself updated, subscribe to Indigo Learn and click the bell icon and download our app OneFin to start learning on the go. In registration chapter, revocation of cancellation. So friends, in general, what is the time limit my dear friends? In general, the time limit for filing application for revocation of cancellation of registration is basically within 30 days from the date of service of order of cancellation. So let's say for example, there is one person Mr. A whose registration is cancelled and he has been received a cancellation order. That means basically A has been served a cancellation order. Then Mr. A can apply for revocation of cancellation within 30 days from the date of service of cancellation order. But one interesting point to be noted here is that by virtue of notification number 15 by 2021 dated 18th May 2021 they brought an interesting amendment stating that in general the time limit for application for revocation of cancellation of registration is basically 30 days from the date of service of order of cancellation. However my dear friends that period of 30 days may be extended for another maximum 30 days by additional or joint commissioner and moreover it can be further extended for another maximum 30 days by commissioner so in short the point to be noted is that even though general time limit for filing application for revocation is 30 days from the date of service of cancellation order the set period of 30 days may be extended for another maximum 30 days by additional or joint commissioner or again further maximum 30 days by commissioner this is one newly introduced amendment by virtue of notification number 15 by 2021 which deals with the concept of extension of time limit for application for revocation of cancelled registration a very interesting concept which has come up very recently and that is the story of this concept of section 30 revocation of cancellation next amendment is from 11th chapter tax inverse credit note debit note the concept of e-invoicing is applicable to those category of persons whose aggregate turnover exceeds how much my dear friends 50 crores once upon a time it was 500 crores then they changed it to 100 crores and recently they changed it to 50 crores but let me tell you an interesting concept here that the concept of e-invoicing is not applicable to certain category of persons who are those number one SCZ unit, SCZ stands for special economic zone units. Those are special areas notified by the government and which are treated as if they are outside India. There are some areas notified in Pune, Bangalore, Chennai, Kolkata, Hyderabad, some metro cities and top cities in India. They have notified some areas as special economic zones. So there are some category of persons or some category of type of categories where e-invoicing concept is not applicable even though aggregate turnover exceeds 50 crores but the first one SCZ unit second one insurer or a banking company or a financial institution including NBFC that is non-banking financial company so for insurance company and banks this concept of e-invoicing is not applicable third category that is goods transport agency that is person engaged in transportation of goods by road we know that word gta right so many times we heard this word gta goods transport agency then fourth category is person engaged in passenger transport service that means what he is engaged in transportation of passengers previous point was gta person engaged in transportation of goods by road this point is passenger transport service so what the first point we had First point is SCZ unit. Second point, insurer or banking company or financial institution including NBFC. What is the third one my dear friends? The third point is GTA engaged in transportation of goods by road. Fourth point is passenger transportation service. Then fifth point is person engaged in exhibition of cinematograph film in multiplex screens like PVR, Inox all these places they basically run multiplex screens and they give an entry ticket they are giving service by way of admission to exhibition of cinematograph film in multiplex screens so these were actually the five categories of persons for whom the concept of e-invoicing is not applicable moreover my dear friends by virtue of 
notification number 23 by 2021 dated 1st june 2021 they have clarified that this concept of invoicing is also not applicable to a government department or to a local authority even though their aggregate turnover exceeds 50 crores so in net effect my dear friends who are all those category of persons for whom invoicing is not applicable even though aggregate turnover exceeds 50 crores first one is what come on SCZ unit second insurer or banking company or a financial institution including NBFC third category person engaged in transportation of goods by road that is GTA fourth one person engaged in passenger transport service fifth one come on guys what is the fifth one person engaged in exhibition of cinematograph film in multiplex screens and the latest point added is any government department or a local authority so these are the categories of persons who are exempted from the concept of invoicing even though their aggregate turnover exceeds 50 crores very very interesting and latest concept high probability that question can trigger in the exam next amendment is in relation to topic of e bill now an interesting amendment my dear friends which has come up by notification number 15 by 2021 dated 18th may 2021 we just discussed that as per rule 138e if any person fails to furnish return for a continuous period of two months then the facility for generation of e bill is blocked either as a consignor or as a consignee that means what for the purpose of outward movement of goods or for inward movement of goods there is no question of he generating an e bill but now the interesting amendment which has come up is something like this listen carefully friends so let's say there are two persons mr ramesh and mr suresh now ramesh is planning to send some goods to suresh okay my dear friends but the point to be noted here is suresh is someone who did not file gst return for the last two months that means what suresh gst number is suspended or suresh facility of e bill is blocked now the interesting point is ramesh wants to send goods to suresh and ramesh wants to generate e bill stating that he wants to send the goods to suresh can he do that earlier the answer was no but now after notification number 15 by 2021 the answer is yes that means what suresh even though his facility for e bill is blocked since he has failed to furnish return for last two months still some other person can generate an e bill on his name so in short what we are trying to say is that the person whose facility for e bill is blocked because he has failed to furnish return for a period of two months he cannot do outward e bill but there can definitely be an inward e bill that is very much possible that means what i am trying to say is that if suresh is planning to send some goods to one person mr akash for that person suresh wants to generate e bill then suresh cannot do that but when ramesh is sending goods to suresh ramesh can generate an e bill stating that suresh is the receiver that is very much possible so what is blocked is generation of e bill as a consignor but there can definitely be generation of e bill as a consignee so technically they are trying to block outward movement of goods as a consignor in case where there is a failure to furnish return for last two months the facility to generate e bill for outward movement is completely blocked but inward movement is still allowed this is a very very interesting fantastic amendment brought by notification number 15 by 2021 dated 18th may 2021 next amendment is returns chapter section 44 annual return so friends as we just discussed that in case where aggregate error exceeds two crores there is a concept of gst audit which is required to be done by a practicing chartered accountant or a cost accountant but let me tell you an interesting concept now that is with effect from 1st august 2021 they removed the concept of gst audit by a practicing chartered accountant or cost accountant that means in short there is no concept of certification or audit to be done by a practicing chartered accountant or cost accountant but but the concept to be noted here is that they introduced a concept of reconciliation statement 
which was earlier to be certified by a practicing chartered accountant or cost accountant that is to be self certified by the registered person himself there is no requirement to get it done from a practicing chartered accountant or cost accountant that can be self certified so this new concept has come up with effect from 1st august 2021 they removed the concept of gst audit by a practicing chartered accountant or cost accountant also given by section 35 subsection 5 so henceforth there are earlier there used to be three types of audit which were known as department audit special audit and audit under section 355 but now there is no concept of audit under section 355 that is audit by practicing chartered accountant or cost accountant his signature has been removed now that is only by way of self certification basis registered person himself will self certify the reconciliation statement and moreover the interesting concept what they also added is that commissioner is being given a power to exempt any certain class of persons from furnishing of annual return so these are the interesting concept and amendment which has been done with effect from 1st august 2021 next amendment in returns chapter notice to defaulters so friends in general we discuss that what is the late fees my dear friends in case where there is a delay in furnishing gstr 1 or gstr 3b within the due date then what is the late fees under cgst act 100 rupees per day subject to maximum 5000 and this will equally apply in case under sgst act also so technically it is 100 plus 100 200 per day subject to maximum 10000 but one interesting concept and the latest amendment which has come up from june 2021 onwards is something like this that is in general what is the late fees 100 rupees per day subject to maximum 5000 under cgst act same thing under sgst act also but one latest amendment what they have done is in case where there is no liability in gstr 3b that means it is a nil return it is what return nil return then the maximum late fees will be under cgst act 250 sgst act 250 that means maximum it will only be 500 in fact maximum was supposed to be 10000 normally but here it is only 500 now 250 under cgst act 250 under sgst act in case it is a nil return but imagine a case where it is not a nil return numbers are there in that case they divided the persons into three categories category number 1 where aggregate turnover does not exceed 1.5 crores in the preceding financial year category number 2 aggregate turnover exceeds 1.5 crores but does not exceed 5 crores in the preceding financial year category number 3 aggregate turnover exceeds 5 crores in the preceding financial year if aggregate turnover exceeds 5 crores in the preceding financial year whatever concept we learned that is applicable that is 100 rupees per day maximum 5000 under cgst 100 rupees per day maximum 5000 under sgst act same thing will apply but in case where aggregate turnover in the preceding financial year does not exceed 1.5 crores then the maximum late fees will be under cgst act 1000 sgst act 1000 that is only 2000 and in second case where aggregate turnover exceeds 1.5 crores but does not exceed 5 crores then the maximum late fees is 2500 under cgst 2500 under sgst maximum it will become only 5000 but where aggregate turnover is more than 5 crores then the maximum late fees is 5000 under cgst 5000 under sgst act so this is an interesting amendment which has come up with respect to maximum late fees that can be imposed with respect to gstr 1 as well as gstr 3b and let me also tell you my dear friends that with respect to gstr 4 which is a return to be filed annually in case of composition registered person in that case my dear friends if there is a failure to furnish the return gstr 4 within the due date and it is filed after the due date then the late fees is something like this if it is a nil return where there is no data involved there then the maximum late fees is 250 under cgst 250 under sgst maximum that is 500 but in case where there is a data that it is it is not a nil return in that case my dear friends maximum late fees will be 1000 under cgst and 1000 under sgst that is maximum 
so this way my dear friends they have simplified and reduced the maximum late fees that is imposed in case of delayed filing of gstr1 gstr 3b or gstr 4 now my dear friends let me also tell you there is one more interesting amendment in relation to late fees with respect to the persons who have made a delay in filing gstr 7 now who will file gstr 7 we know that gstr 7 is to be filed by those persons who are required to deduct tax at source under section 51 which is nothing but the department of central government state government local authority public sector undertaking these are the categories of persons notified under section 51 for the purpose of deducting tax at source so if they deduct tax at source and they are required to file gstr 7 by 10th of next month now one new point what they amended is that in case there is a failure to file gstr 7 within the due date and there is a delay my dear friends the late fees to be levied shall be 25 rupees per day of default subject to maximum of 100 rupees that said and this provision is under a cgst act such a brilliant point 25 rupees per day subject to maximum 100 rupees pretty simple and comfortable point there are two three more amendments related to exemptions topic so my dear friends in the exemptions related to services supplied to government now let's take a small example like this so let's say central government gst department contacted shivateja asking me to provide some training services to the gst officer they wanted me to conduct some training to the gst officer on a lot of interesting practical aspects which are going on in the real world so what i've done is i conducted a training program for the gst officers for which remuneration is paid to me by central government getting clarity friends now first of all is this transaction a supply 100 percent answer is yes but let me tell you my dear friends this point is exempt in fact the beautiful point what they have specified in the law is that services supplied to central government state government or union territory under any training program for which 75 percent or more of the total expenditure is met by central government state government or union territory that means for that training program whatever is the expenditure 75 percent or more of the expenditure is met by central government state government or union territory then this particular service is exempt in fact once upon a time they specified that exemption is only when 100 percent amount is met by central government state government union territory but now that particular point they amended now where they specified that exemption is given when 75 percent or more of the total expenditure is met by central government state government or union territory in relation to any training program where service is provided to central government state government or union territory in that case that particular service is exempt friends now one more new interesting point which has been included in the exemption list that is something like this friends we all know that lot of times when we go on state highways national highways we tend to see huge trucks which carry tremendous goods in the trucks my dear friends correct so basically those trucks belong to the transport company or the trucks are owned by some companies for the purpose of transportation of goods now in order to move like that from one state to another state through national highways state highways and other places they are required to obtain a permit known as national permit which is actually given by government so what is the new point that has come up my dear friends that is service by way of granting national permit to a goods carriage national permit is something like a permission given to that vehicle or a big lorry or a big container for operating throughout the state highways and national highways so service by way of granting national permit to goods carriage that particular service is exempt so basically when we take, apply for national permit we are required to pay some permit fee on that permit fee gst will not apply because that service is exempt service by way of granting national permit to goods carriage for operating throughout india or between different different states so this particular service of granting national permit to goods carriage is straight away exempt this is a new point of exemption which has come up 
earlier once upon a time this was taxable but this has recently been brought under exemptions list a new point and high possibility that question may trigger in the exam amendment is in the topic place of supply section 1313 notified services so friends as we discussed as per section 1313 in respect of certain notified services place of supply will be the place of effective use and enjoyment of a service in that we discuss that one point has been notified that is with respect to research and development service related to pharmaceutical industry now one more new point which has come up by virtue of notification number 3 by 2021 dated 2nd june 2021 and this notification deals with the concept of maintenance repair or overhauling service technically we call it as mro service maintenance repair overhaul service in respect of ships so basically let's take for example there is one company known as abc limited in india which is engaged in shipping business now for one particular ship in india they wanted to take maintenance or repair or overhaul service and they have taken the service from abroad they have taken service from abroad from a company known as abc inc so indian entity which is engaged in shipping business has taken service from abroad what is that service maintenance repair or overhaul related to a ship indian entity is engaged in shipping business now for that maintenance repair or overhaul service place of supply will be the location of recipient that is the place where effective use and enjoyment of service which is nothing but location of recipient that means technically place of supply becomes india and once place of supply is india location of supplier is outside india it technically becomes an import of service and once it is an import of service receiver is required to pay tax under reverse charge mechanism obviously because we know the concept that if supplier is located in non taxable territory receiver is located in taxable territory then definitely it is covered under reverse charge mechanism where receiver himself is required to discharge the tax liability there is no requirement to pay to the supplier so in nutshell in a simple manner the whole concept of all this is that as per section 1313 one new point they notified stating that in case of maintenance repair or overhaul service related to a ship taken by a shipping company or shipping entity place of supply will be the location of recipient so that is how technically it qualifies as import of service if a indian shipping company takes service from abroad in relation to maintenance repair overhaul it qualifies as an import of service this is one new point which has been introduced in section 13 subsection 13 now my dear friends let me discuss one very very interesting and fantastic amendment which has come up by notification number 15 by 2021 dated 18th may 2021 now what is the point friends let's say there one person mr anand he wants to claim refund maybe because of export of services or export of goods or because of any appellate order he is eligible for refund or maybe because inverted duty structure or he wants to claim refund from electronic cash ledger whatever reason it is now we know that in general the time limit for application of refund is within 2 years from relevant date and relevant date is different under different circumstances now here let's take a small example like this anand made an application for the purpose of claiming refund now when anand made application for purpose of claiming refund we know that if there is any deficiency in the application that proper data is not filled proper information is not submitted then officer rejects the application by issuing a deficiency memo in case a deficiency memo is issued then the applicant or the registered person should make a fresh refund application this concept we already know my dear friends but now the interesting amendment which has come up by virtue of notification is something like this where they have specified that where we know that in general the time limit for application is within a period of 2 years we know this concept right now for the purpose of calculating this 2 years time limit the time period from the date of filing application till the date when the deficiency memo is issued otherwise till the date when 
the deficiency is communicated to the registered person. So basically, let's say for example, Anand has applied for refund on 10th October 21. 10th October 21. And officer has given a deficiency memo stating that he will not process the refund. He gave a deficiency memo on 10th December 21. Clear my dear friends. Now, for the purpose of calculating the time period of 2 years, the period from 10, 10, 21 to 10, 12, 21 shall be excluded. So, in computing the time period of 2 years, the time period from date of filing application till the date when deficiency memo is issued or deficiency memo is communicated, that period shall be excluded for calculating the time period of 2 years for the purpose of making an application for refund. Next new amendment my dear friends. This is a pretty simple point. Now what is the new point they have introduced is that they inserted sub rule 5 and sub rule 6 in rule 90 where they have specified that if any person has made an application for refund before the provisional order is passed or before refund is sanctioned or before any show cause notice is issued the applicant or the person who has filed the refund application, he is given a facility to withdraw the refund application. So at any point of time, he wishes to withdraw the refund application, he can do so. so earlier, before, there was no facility to withdraw the refund application once filed, unless deficiency memo is issued. After deficiency memo is issued, he has to file a fresh refund application. But now the point here is that after refund application is filed, if the applicant himself is of the opinion that there is some mistake in the application, he himself can withdraw the refund application. Such a brilliant new point which has come up. Next interesting amendment, my dear friends, listen. So let's say, let me continue the same example, same person, Mr. Anand made an application for refund, but for some reason, the refund order is withheld. That means order is not passed. For some reason, maybe some deficiency is there. Maybe the officer wants to check the refund and he wants to decide whether to give the refund or not. So for some reason or for some specified reason, the refund order is withheld. That means what? Proper officer has not granted refund for some specified reason. And in that case, my dear friends, in case where the reason for which the refund was withheld, the reason is completely satisfied and the reason no longer exists, he will first pass order for a release of withheld refund and then he will pass refund sanction order. So let me tell you my dear friends, if for any reason the refund is withheld for any specified reason, then if that reason no more exists or that reason is technically satisfied, in that case my dear friends, proper officer should first pass order for a release of withheld refund and then he will pass refund sanction order. Directly he cannot pass refund sanction order. First he has to pass order for a release of withheld refund and only then the pass order for a refund sanction. That is a procedure to be followed by the proper officer. One more last interesting amendments in refunds topic my dear friends, but this is slightly crazy and scary also for that matter. The point is that in case where a person has made a refund application, and his refund, let's say, got adjusted towards outstanding demand. For example, Anand made application for refund of 10 lakhs. But there is an outstanding demand from Anand of 12 lakh rupees. Now, whatever refund Anand has applied, even though the refund is valid, that refund is adjusted towards outstanding demand. Earlier, the concept was that in case where any refund is adjusted towards outstanding demand, proper officer was required to pass an order stating that refund is adjusted towards outstanding demand. But now they removed that concept. That means in short, even though the refund is adjusted towards outstanding demand, there is no requirement for the proper officer to pass an order stating that refund is adjusted towards outstanding demand. Such a crazy point. So these are the very very interesting amendments which have come up with respect to refunds topic. High possibility that a small question may trigger in the exam. Next amendment is in job work chapter 17th chapter. The time limit for filing ITC 04. Earlier it was quarterly but now they change the time limits. So ITC 04 is a form which is required to be submitted by the principal and in order to 
give the details of the goods sent to job worker and goods received back from job worker and the whole idea of ITC 04 is to ensure that government will have a complete track of the movement of goods sent from principal to job worker and received back from job worker so the whole so the whole idea is to track the movement of goods earlier the concept was very simple that this ITC 04 was required to be filed on quarterly basis by 25th of the month succeeding the end of quarter. But let me tell you my dear friends with effect from 1st October 2021 the due dates have been changed where they have specified that if the aggregate turnover during preceding financial year does not exceed 5 crores does not exceed 5 crores then you are required to file GST ITC 04 on annual basis by 25th of April of next financial year. Obviously, so for example, for April 20 to March 21, we have to file by 25th April 2021. So if aggregate turnover during preceding financial year does not exceed 5 crores, then ITC 04 is to be filed on annual basis. But if aggregate turnover during preceding financial year exceeds 5 crores, then GST ITC 04 is to be filed on half yearly basis for April to September by 25th of October, for October to March by 25th of April. That is the due date. So basically earlier the frequency of filing was quarterly basis, but now they changed that to half yearly or yearly. Half yearly in case where aggregate turnover during preceding financial year exceeds 5 crores. But if aggregate turnover during preceding financial year does not exceed 5 crores, then yearly only once by 25th of April. If more than 5 crores, then half yearly once, 25th October, 25th April. This amendment is effective from 1st October 2021. The first interesting amendment in foreign trade policy is something like this, my dear friends. As we all know, foreign trade policy comes every five years once, which was technically the latest one is 2015 to 2020. But this got extended for a period of one more year due to COVID circumstances. Subsequently, it was extended till 30th September 2021. And recently, they extended that even till 31st March 2022. So foreign trade policy 2015 to 2020 along with all the schemes in the foreign trade policy 2015 to 2020 will apply up to 31st March 2022. So accordingly all the exemptions in the foreign trade policy given up to 2020 is now made applicable till 31st March 2022. Basically, the reason for this is all because new foreign trade policy is yet to be formalized and which government is yet to do that. And amid the COVID situation in India, they did not do that. So the existing policy, which was actually closed by 2020, that only they are continuing now. So that will still continue up to 31st March 2022. Subsequently, we have to wait and see whether they'll extend the existing policy or they might bring a new policy. One more interesting amendment, my dear friends. And this is with effect from 10th August 2021. Friends, as we all know that there is one authority which takes care of foreign trade with regard to foreign trade policy, technically known as DGFT, which stands for Director General of Foreign Trade. He has got supremacy power in terms of imposing any prohibitions or imposing any restrictions or relaxing any conditions or granting any approval or withdrawing any exemptions. Now, the interesting point is that with effect from 10th August 2021, they have notified various list of circumstances where DGFT may impose prohibitions or restrictions in different different circumstances wherein they have given a lot of points where DGFT may impose prohibition or restrictions. Now, what are those points? Let's look at them. Come on, first one. First, on export of foodstuffs or other essential products, for preventing or relieving critical shortages. So what is the first point my dear friends? On export of foodstuffs or other essential products for preventing or relieving critical shortages. On this particular thing, they might impose any prohibition or restriction and generally DGFT does that by issuing a notification. Second point. On imports and exports necessary for the application of standards 
or regulations for the classification, grading and marketing of commodities in international trade. Next, on import of fisheries product imported in any form for enforcement of governmental measures to restrict production of domestic product or for certain other purpose. Next, on import to safeguard country's external financial position and to ensure a level of reserves. So, in all these cases, they can impose prohibition or restrictions. Then, on imports to promote establishment of a particular industry, lot of times they will impose prohibition on some particular products in order to ensure that they will protect an Indian market. That is where we would have heard the concept of safeguard duty, anti-dumping duty and all. Next, for preventing sudden increase in imports from causing serious injury to domestic producers or to relieve producers who have suffered such injury. Then, for protection of public morale or to maintain public order. Next point, very interesting. For protection of human, animal or plant life or health. Next, relating to importation or exportation of gold or silver. So, with respect to gold or silver, they might impose some prohibition or restriction. Next point, necessary to ensure compliance with laws and regulations including those relating to production of patents, trademark, copyright and prevention of deceptive practices. Next, prohibition or restriction relating to products of prison labor. Then, for production of natural treasures of artistic, historic or archaeological value. Next, for the conservation of exhaustible natural resources. For ensuring essential quantities for the domestic processing industry. The next point, essential to the acquisition or distribution of products in general or local short supply. Next, some more prohibition restriction what they can do for the protection of countries essential security interest related to fissionable materials or the materials from which they are derived relating to the traffic in arms and ammunition and implements of war taken in time of war or other emergency in international relations. Or finally, impose prohibition or restriction in pursuance of country's obligation under the United Nations Charter for the maintenance of international peace and security. So basically, why all these points are introduced is that they are basically trying to give power to DGFT, stating that my dear DGFT, through a notification, you can impose prohibition or restriction under any of these circumstances in order to ensure that we match with our international standard and to be commensurate with international agreements. So this is one new point what they have introduced in our foreign trade policy where they have given power to DGFT to impose any prohibition or restriction by virtue of notification on any of these matters what we discussed now.